Okay, so, um, so like Professor Rowe mentioned, um, Ida couldn't be here today, but on behalf of him, I'd like to express his uh, gratitude and uh, that he, we're very thankful for the, um, to the Butler family for their generous support in our research, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present our findings in this uh, distinguished forum. Um, so uh, I'm a physician, um, and uh, now hope, um, and now in the last three years, I've been doing conducting research on uh, on something that is close to me clinically, uh, which is multiple myeloma. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about our findings um, and uh, what we've been doing. So. Myeloma is, uh, is a very common cancer. It's actually the second most common cancer uh, of the blood. Um, it uh, affects globally more than um, 230,000 people. Um, and um, more than 95% of people with myeloma are uh, diagnosed at a very advanced stage. Um, so, like you can see, this is a huge uh, clinical problem, and uh, and the uh, the median age for diagnosis is over 65. Um, the disease is characterized by a pre-malignant uh, state, which we call MGAS, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And at this stage, uh, the monoclonal protein, the the immunoglobulin band, which we see in the serum protein electrophoresis. Is, uh, is not very high, and the clonal, and there is a relatively arbitrary cutoff for, uh, for clonal uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow uh, that are less than 10%, and the patient is asymptomatic. Now, as the disease progresses, um, it progresses into a smoldering myeloma, which uh, uh, the, the percent of the plasma cells increase in the bone marrow, um, but still the patient is asymptomatic. And um, finally, um, and in both of these stages, the approach is just to, um, to watch for waiting. Um, and finally, the disease progresses, in some cases, to active myeloma, and, um, and there, the, the predominant manifestations are renal failure, uh, very painful bone lesions, uh, anemia, and uh, immune deficiencies, where typically patients die from uh, either the, um, uh, the renal insufficiency um, complications or uh, infections. So even though there's been a lot of progress in the last uh, five years or so uh, in multiple myeloma with many uh, novel uh, therapies just approved, um, there's still quite un unmet needs in this, uh, in this devastating disease. Uh, first, we need to accurately diagnose patients with, with very uh, early disease. Um, second, we need to tailor a specific uh, treatment, precision, precision medicine, if you will, uh, for, for the specific drivers in this disease. Um, we need to do better with non-invasive diagnostic testing. Um, I should point out that a patient who has a diagnosis of uh, pre-myeloma, MGAS or smoldering, um, undergoes through um, uh, multiple bone marrow uh, aspiration and biopsies that are quite uh, painful. Um, so we'd like to. So we'd like a very effective mean of of, of uh, diagnosing and um, and following up patients from the from the peripheral blood. Um, and we also want to characterize the the immune. Um, microenvironment uh, to be better at uh, immunotherapy. Um, now, we're a single cell uh, a genomic lab. Uh, we also do a lot of epigenetic studies, but uh, in the last few years, we're mostly focused on, on, on single cell genomics. And um, I think there's a, there a really um, a burst of, of publications in, in the last uh, five years or so uh, um, that um, tells you that single cell genomics are basically um, transforming biology and hopefully medicine in the, in the upcoming years. And this is because we were able to gain um, high uh, resolution that was uh, previously 
um, imaginative. Like we we uh, we can now uh, detect um, all basically um, more than 30% of the transcripts in each single cell and and annotate them very accurately. Um, so. This is, uh, we use a facts-based uh, method. Um, I'll briefly go over it. Uh, so we take, but this, is, this can be done for every sort of uh, tissue, and we already did it for, um, for mice models of, of Alzheimer's and in other uh, diseases, but, uh, but for this case, I will, I will illustrate the bone marrow um, tissue. So we, uh, we generate a single cell suspension, um, and then uh, we fax sort um, into 384 well plates uh, that contain uh, tiny amounts of, of barcoded primers. Now, as the cell lands into one of those uh, micro wells, uh, it, it is lysed and its RNA is being um, preserved. And uh, late, and every um, every um, micro well has its own uh, barcoded primer, and then we do reverse transcription, and uh, and uh, we pull, and then we uh, sequence. Uh, obviously, we use a lot of uh, um, automation, a lot of liquid handlers, um, and. For the myeloma study, um, we we had a, um, we had some interesting uh, logistic uh, um, logistic um, I would say um, problems at the beginning, but uh, but later we have solved most of them using our own clinical co coordinators that uh, that uh, we we hired. This is um, uh, the the sampling quality is is actually uh, crucial for the for the success of the study because the tissue needs to be uh, fresh and needs to be very very high quality. The the bone marrow aspirates need, need needs to be um, of 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 uh, good um, that. A very good representation of what's indeed going on within the bone marrow. Um, so I work very closely with uh, with the myeloma physicians from five different medical centers. Um, we recruited for this study uh, 50 patients. Uh, now some of them we have longitudinal samples from their from baseline and through their therapy and th throughout the course of their therapy. And um, what we do is we um, we uh, compare also the, the the clinical diagnosis that has been routinely done, and um, we profile their their samples in a fresh manner. So basically, what it means is that the um, basically what it means is that the, our clinical coordinator is on site, taking the sample, put it on ice, and gets it into Weizmann within 30 minutes. Um, and then we complete the sorting within three hours. Um, everything is done. Um, everything is done um, fresh. Um, now, it is actually imperative to have a good uh, control uh, for this. So, in, in it's actually in, in in solid tissues, in solid tumors, there's a problem of that you take the margins of the tumor that are supposedly healthy. Uh, but uh, in this case, since it is a liquid tumor, this, this was not possible. Uh, so what we did is we went to uh, total hip replacement patients who only have isolated arthritis, and we calibrated. Uh, it wasn't that easy. It took me a lot of time in the operating theater, but we calibrated um, uh, a method to freshly take out the, uh, the bone marrow. Uh, with the help of the orthopedic surgeons, and um, and we do the same thing for the normal plasma cells. Uh, this is a typical sorting strategy. So you see the plasma cell. This is a patient with uh, with uh, smoldering myeloma. So you can see that um, um, the, we sort the CD138, CD38 uh, positive cells. And what we get in the end, after all this process that we do, so we have now more than 25,000 um, single cells that we sequenced, and now we have basically sort of a, of a map. So every uh, raw in, and every raw in the map is, is a gene, and every, um, and every column is a single cell. And um, so you basically have for each cell the, um, the expression 
um, of, uh, of more than 1,500 uh, genes. This is just a representation of, uh, of 200. And now what we do is um, we use a kind of very similar approach to what Facebook does, uses, uh, um, um, we, we um, try to learn about, of, about the properties of a specific cell from its um, neighbors or friends. So um, we use a, a social, um, uh, like a social um, network uh, approach and then we define those clusters um, in an unbiased manner. So, what we discovered is that um, when, we, when we look at the healthy plasma cells, so they typically cluster to three uh, different clusters representing either short or long-lived plasma cells within the bone marrow. Um, but uh, when you look at the patients, um, so the, the bad news is, like uh, Professor Rechavi mentioned, uh, the transcriptomic heterogeneity. So the, the bad news is that each patient basically is his own, like is a full world of its own. Like um, um, it's it's every patient is very uh, unique um, and clusters differently. Now um, now we see the the usual suspects for for myeloma here, um, and you see the cyclin D1, cyclin D2. Um, and you see, uh, so w we know that these are indeed plasma cell. Another thing that we're very um, clean about and, uh, is that the way we filter the cells, so we take advantage of the fact that plasma cells have a lot of immunoglobulin. Uh, most of their, like almost, I would say 60% of their transcripts are immunoglobulin. They're just a machine to, the, they're, they're machines for, for um, antibody production. So it, it's computationally, it's relatively easy to filter out the non-plasma cells. So this is a very clean analysis, unlike in other studies that are done with CD138 magnetic beads that, has, that have up to 20% of, of, um, of uh, monocytes um, there that interfere with the, with the bulk data. Um, so even though each patient is, has a unique gene expression signature, we do have, uh, we do have uh, convergence. Um, this is another way to present the data. This is a 2D um, re representation of the data called TSNI. Um, and so you see the giant blob in the middle, that's normal plasma cells. And uh, this, this is a, a patient with a small clone. This is a, an MGAS patient. And um, so all the normal, um, all the healthy controls, um, they cluster together in the huge blob in the middle, but every patient is quite distinct, like you see here. Um, but, and um, here you can see that uh, um, in MGAS, where you have less than 10% of uh, clonal plasma cells in the bone marrow, so you have a small clone. Um, So there's the small clone here, but all these cells are normal, which is what we expect because this patient has a mixture of normal cells with a small clone. Unlike patients with, um, w unlike a patient with an active disease that more than 90% of his cells are, mal are malignant. <clears throat> Um, so what about the convergence that I talked about? So indeed patients, um, they, they tend to, to um, be relatively close to one another if they're cycling D1 overexpressing. Um, and we also found some uh, new targets that weren't, um, that weren't, found, that weren't uh, found before. Um, we mainly think when we look at the, at the um, uh, large sequencing studies that were done in myeloma, we mainly think that's because they didn't have the healthy controls. So because we do have that, though, it's relatively easy to see which gene is indeed um, um, relevant just to the malignant cells or not, and we can also filter out nicely the normal plasma cells from the malignant one, so we can do this analysis much more easily. Now, I think the, the, the strength of this method is also to detect heterogeneity within the patient. So this is an example for a patient that has two different what we call transcriptional clones. 
Um, like you can see, and these, these are all plasma cells, so the, so, um, so these two clusters, whoop, back, sorry. Okay. So these two clusters, the right clusters, are the, the um, uh, his plasma cells. So you, so you can see that they're, they, they have a very distinct uh, expression pattern. This was actually quite surprising. This is, uh, um, this is a clone that has um, the Fencine beta-1 um, overexpression, which is basically a neutrophilic gene. We, we didn't expect to find it in a plasma cell, but we're very sure that this is indeed in plasma cells, because like I mentioned, all these cells have a lot of immunoglobulin. So we're very sure that it's not just a neutrophil um, that, uh, that we sequenced here. It's, it's, it's really inside the, the malignant plasma cells. And um, up to a third of the patients in our cohort have this heterogeneity of um, between two to three clones, transcriptional clones. Um, another thing that we can do is because we sequence the entire BCR, uh, b b the, um, because we sequence the, um, the, uh, the mRNA molecules, and because I mentioned that the uh, plasma cells highly express the immunoglobulin, so we basically sequence also their BCR and we can infer the clonality. Um, the clonality of the cells from their BCR sequence. And here you can see that in the controls, which, in the, which are the upper part of the, of the um, scheme here, so they have a um, um, heterogeneous um, uh, composition of their immunoglobulin, unlike the patients um, who have a very specific immunoglobulin um, sequence. So in the... Um, few minutes that I still have left, I will illustrate just a few clinical cases. So this is a, this is a patient that his diagnosis wasn't really sure he had. That we um, we uh, sampled him when, when he had a very pathological free light chain ratio, but however his bone marrow aspirate and biopsy didn't, um, um, uh, didn't um, um, we didn't find, the, the pathologist didn't find any evidence of increased plasma cells. Um, however, his, his renal biopsy had uh, lambda light chain precipitation, and there was really, the, the clinicians were very, um, they didn't know whether they should treat him or not. Um, so when we sequenced his bone marrow, indeed most of the cells were normal, but we found a very small clone um, that is CCND1 overexpressed, that is restricted to lambda, and also overexpressed as IL-6 receptor. Um, another thing that uh, we then, this was all newly diagnosed patients, so we went ahead and asked ourselves, okay, can we detect minimal residual disease? So this is an example of the patient that underwent uh, an auto stem cell transplant for myeloma. He's in a very good partial response. Um, and his, um, his uh, fax, his uh, bone marrow aspiration is normal, his fax is also normal, but when we sequenced um, uh, uh, 1,300 cells, we were able to find um, 20 cells, 23 cells that, that uh, cluster uh, separately, and they indeed overexpress cyclin D2 and ITGB7 and MAFB, all known drivers in myeloma. So we basically found the clone um, in this particular patient. Now, this has implications for future therapies. For instance, we now have CAR T cells that are directed against ITGB7. Um, so this patient can, um, can maybe one day treat, um, treat it with this kind of, uh, of uh, treatment when he relapses. Um, we can also detect this in the peripheral blood. Um, so we take circulating tumor cells in the blood that are very rare, one to 100,000 events um, in, the, in the flow cytometer after enriching. And we can also detect uh, um, uh, the same uh, uh, transcriptional changes. We also found some markers that, are, um, that we can say that are related to healthy, um, uh, normal plasma blasts that are proliferating, unlike the true circulating tumor cells. And, um, 
And basically, we find a very good correlation between the malignant um, bone marrow cells and the malignant peripheral blood cells. So this tells us that this is indeed a method that can be used um, um, to longitudinally assess the patients. So to summarize, um, I hope I showed you that single cell RNA sequencing is a powerful tool um, to, to capture the inter and intertumor heterogeneity, even in very low tumor burden settings. Um, we can find novel targets and drivers by using single cell analysis and the right controls. This is necessary. And uh, we can also detect circulating tumor cells in myeloma, which are correlated with a bone marrow disease. Thank you. <laughs>